Hey everyone, this is Kevin from the ChessWebsite.com. Today we're going to be starting a new series on Bobby Fischer, and we're going to take a look at some of his most memorable games that he's ever played. Obviously, Bobby Fischer, being one of the greatest chess players that's ever played, has played some extremely epic matches, and you can learn a lot from his matches. So, I thought this would be a great series to start with, and the first game we're going to be looking at today comes from his very first U.S. Championship. It was back in 1957. At the time... He was only 14 years of age, um, and in 1957, he actually had his second best record ever. A few years later, he would actually have a perfect 11 points. Um, but in this one, he ended up winning uh, at the ripe age of 14. The next year, he actually went on to become the youngest grandmaster of all time. So he's not quite at that level yet. He's still very young, but extremely talented for his age. And so in this championship, we're going to be looking at one of his matches is between... James Sherwin at the time, a 24-year-old player, actually got third in this tournament, so an extremely um, you know, accomplished U.S. player in his own right. And Bobby Fischer in this match is going to be playing the white pieces. James Sherwin's going to be defending with the black pieces. Bobby Fischer starts off with pawn e4, pawn c5. This is the Sicilian defense, so if you're not familiar, I definitely recommend checking out that video. But continue with knight f3, pawn d6, pawn d4. And then after capture, the knight recaptures knight f6, just development moves, knight c3, and then pawn to a6. Black has a lot of different variations that he could go into. He could try some of the dragon lines. Um, in this particular defense, James Sherwin decided to play the knight dwarf, just this pawn to a6. And this is one of the most common defenses that you'll see in top level play. Again, Bobby Fischer, a huge proponent of this pawn to e4. And so the Sicilian defense knight dwarf variation um, is extremely popular for black at high level. Bobby Fischer is going to continue with bishop to c4. Again, development move, trying to control the center of the board, also attacking this pawn here in s7. Sherwin's going to respond with pawn to e6, kind of blocking off, getting ready to you know, have this solid pawn chain right here. But wants to make sure this light square bishop isn't doing a whole heck of a lot. Bobby Fischer's going to castle on the king side. And then black's going to start a little counterattack um, and try to push forward and put some pressure on this bishop on c4. The bishop's just going to come back here to b3, and black's not done, going to push forward with his pawn here to c3. Now Bobby Fischer plays knight to b1. Uh, not really the more common moves that you'll see from white. Underdeveloping your pieces back here to b1, um, usually kind of frowned upon. It's more common to see, you know, knight to a4. Um, you know, still somewhat of an active piece. You never want to have your your knights on the on the edge here. Um, but it's going to be very easy later for him to get involved into the game. Uh, you know, move like knight to c c5. Um, after this pawn moves, you can always place. You know, pawn right here or pawn here on b4 and have a nice little outpost. But uh, Bobby Fischer plays knight to b1. And then the bishop's going to come here to d7. Again, getting all the pieces developed into the game. Bobby Fischer going to play bishop to e3, getting his dark square bishop involved into the game. The knight's going to come here to c6. And then Bobby Fischer is going to play pawn to f3. Now, black did have the option here. He could have, you know, played knight takes here on e4, which wouldn't have been, you know, all that bad. He decided not to. Um, instead, he decided to just play, you know, knight to c6, and then the pawn's going to come here to f3 and protect this pawn. Black responds with bishop to f7, getting all of his minor pieces involved into the game. Center of the board right here, both of his bishops connected in the knights over here, so that he can castle on the king side. Bobby Fischer is now going to play pawn to c3. What Bobby Fischer really wants is he wants this pawn to recapture so that his knight can recapture here on c3. This would be best case scenario for Bobby Fischer that he can recapture and get his knight back involved into the game. Now after this pawn to c3, Black actually did respond and he took with his pawn here on you know c3. He did have different options. He could have played something like pawn to a5. Um, that way, you know, if the pawn takes here on b4 and the pawn recaptures, this is opening up this a file for this rook here. It's also really holding down, you know, this square here on c3. Again, Bobby Fischer wants to get this knight involved into the game, so this is just going to be a thorn in his side for the time being. So, um, again, definitely uh, not the recommended way just to do exactly what Bobby Fischer wants you to do. Uh, but the pawn's going to take right here. And then Bobby Fischer first takes with his knight here on c6. And then after the bishop takes on c6, uh, Bobby Fischer is going to play knight takes on c3. Again, he now has all of his minor pieces involved into the board. He's controlling the center of the board. Next thing he needs to do is get his queen. 
he's connected his rooks on the back row, and then he can really start to attack his opponent. Now black responds with castling on the king side. Again, king side safety is always important. Bobby Fisher now plays rook to c1. You want to get your rooks active squares, meaning you want to get them in open files, semi-open files, so they can roam around the board. Again, if you have your rooks that aren't active, you're going to have a huge piece that's not really doing a whole heck of a lot in the game. So rook to c1, nice little move. The queen's going to come over here to b8, nice little active square, putting a lot of pressure on the queen side um, from Bobby Fischer here. And then Bobby Fischer plays knight to d5, really, really aggressive square. He could have, you know, played knight to e2, opening up for his rook to come to c6, putting a lot of pressure on that open file. He decides instead to play knight to d5. Now in the game, Sherman actually took with his pawn here on d5. Probably would have made more sense if he captured with his knight here on d5. Bobby Fischer has a lot of different ways that he can recapture, but at the end of the day, um, the end solution is Bobby Fischer doesn't have a super aggressive position. In the actual game, the pawn took here on d5, and then after the rook took on c6, and then the pawns come off the board, this is going to be very aggressive for Bobby Fischer. Obviously, you can tell right here that his rook is on the c6 file, very aggressive. He has both of his bishops here kind of dominating the center of the board. And this dark square bishop for James Sherwin isn't doing a whole heck of a lot. So, again, this is the position that, you know, Sherwin ended up with. Probably would have made more sense if instead he captured with his knight here on d5. From here, black plays queen to b5. You know, pretty active square. Um, you know, he could have just played... Knight to e4, but he does get into some problems with bishop here to d5. Um, again, he has a discovered attack if he moves his rook. So he decides, okay, I, I don't want to have to deal with that, even though I, I gain material there. So instead, he just decides to play queen here to b5, and then the rook swings over to b6. Now, again, black's in not the worst shape ever. He's definitely going to need to get his dark square bishop involved into the game, but, um, you know, he could play a move like queen to d7 here. Still pretty active, um, controlling a lot of these light squares in the center of the board. Also, you know, protecting this pawn here. This is going to be completely okay. Unfortunately for black, he makes a huge error in the game, and he plays queen over to e5. Again, just not doing a whole heck of a lot for him, and this bishop can now come to d4. Much better square for Bobby Fischer here. Much active, controlling the center of the board, um, and now... Black's just kind of responding. He has, he has no real um, game plan, and Bobby Fischer is just putting all of his pieces into better positions. If you kind of look from Black right here, you know, after the queen comes over here to g5, all of his pieces are just kind of protecting each other. No, nothing's really active. There's no real attack that he has. And White, all of his pieces are aimed you know, at either the center of the board or at the king side. If you look at all these bishops, they're all lined up right here. So Bobby Fischer now plays queen to f3. Didn't really have to do this. Um, he had other options here. He could have tried something, you know, like rook here to b7. You always want to get your rooks on the seventh rank. They can just add so much pressure to your opponent. You know, you're attacking right here on e7. Um, you know, later on the bishop could come here to d5. Nice little outpost for him. So um, definitely had this nice little move that I think he missed. Instead, he played queen here to f3. Wanted to make sure that he was protecting this pawn here on e4 from the knight, you know, coming there and, and taking. Now the knight's going to come over here to d7. Less active square for, for black, um, you know, attacking the knight, but it's not really doing a whole heck of a lot considering that the knight or that the rook can just come here to b7. And this is exactly where Bobby Fischer wants his, his rook, is on the seventh rake, um, you know, putting a lot of pressure on his opponent. But James Sherwin now brings his knight here to e5. Nice little outpost move, recognizing that Bobby Fischer's probably not going to exchange, you know, his bishop off since, you know, it's an open board and bishops tend to do better, especially later game um, in an open game since they just control more of the board right here. So recognizing this, this is going to be a nice little outpost for black. And the queen just comes back here to e2. Nice little safe move from Bobby Fischer. Doesn't want to have to exchange off. And considering his queen is being attacked, he definitely has to move it. Now, although we talked about the reasons why Bobby Fischer might not want to get rid of his bishop, it still probably would have been a decent move for Bobby Fischer just to take with his bishop here on e5. After the queen takes or the pawn takes, if we look at it, you know, the pawn takes here on e5, um, you know, Bobby Fischer still has more aggressive pieces. He has his bishop and his queen and his rook all lined up on this, you know, f7 square right here. 
also his rook on b7 is very active. So, you know, although he brought his queen back and, you know, that's not the worst move ever, he still would have had a very good game if he took with his bishop here on e5. But we've, if we come back here, uh, after the knight comes to e5, the queen's going to come down to e2. And then the bishop comes to f Six wants to make sure it's still not being harassed by this rook here on b7. Uh, definitely needs to get it to a better square. And then the queen's going to come over here to h1. Wants to make sure, since he doesn't have a pawn here on f2, that later into the game he doesn't have to deal with, you know, let's say this knight moved and then the bishop took here on d4 and there would be a check. Uh, wants to make sure that he just has his king in a very safe position. Now the pawn's going to push forward on a5. If you kind of look at this from black, you know, what is he really going to do? He needs to have some sort of counterattack. Um, yes, both sides are even in material, but white's just way more aggressive. So he needs to find some sort of counterattack. And pawn a4, attacking on the, the queen side, is really all that he has right now. White's now going to play bishop to d5, and this is a great move from Bobby Fischer. You always need to be looking out for outposts for your pieces, and this is a great outpost for his bishop here on d5. Not only is it in the center of the board, so he can you know, control all the light squares on the board, but also once this rook move, he does have a discovered attack on the rook here on a1. So again, as you're playing your own games, Bobby Fischer does a great job showing us, in this game in particular, we'll see more of that later on, but all these fundamentals in chess that he just plays to perfection. Now the rook's going to come over here to c8, again controlling this long file as we talked about, much better than just over here on rook to a8. Also, um, because of the discovered attack when the rook moves on b7, being attacked by the bishop here on d5, definitely wants to make sure that he moves that rook. Now Bobby Fischer is going to bring his bishop back down to c3, making sure that this rook can't you know, come down to you know, c1, since he does have the protection here from the, the queen here on g5 on c1. Um, so kind of blocking it off right here. Um, outpost on c3 is not nearly as you know, impressive um, or aggressive as you know, here on d5, but it does block off this rook, um, so it kind of makes the attack right away from black somewhat null and void. Black's now going to play pawn to a4. Again, pushing the pawn. It is also being attacked by the bishop here on c3. Uh, so wants to, to move it out of the way. And then Bobby Fischer plays rook over to a7. Attacking his pawn here a4. He does have, in my opinion, a more aggressive move uh, that he could have played. You know, queen to a6 makes a lot of sense right here. Not only putting pressure on the pawn on a4, but also the pawn to d6. And the queen's not really needed. Uh, you know, this pawn's not being you know, attacked anymore by the knight. And his rook on, on f1 is completely safe, doesn't have to worry too much about it. And since this rook's not going to be doing any harm, this queen to a6 is a very, very strong move from Bobby Fischer. But in the game, he played rook over to a7, which seems logical, you know, attacking this, this rook on a4. It's going to be really hard for black to defend this pawn. Um, and so black now plays knight over here to g4 recognizing that, okay, he can't do a whole heck of a lot, but also opening up the door for a discovered attack on the bishop here on c3. Bobby Fischer now plays rook taking on a4. In this position, I, I really feel like he has to play bishop here to d2. Uh, because of the exchange that we'll see here in a second, it just leaves Bobby Fischer in a bad spot. In this position, he's attacking the queen here on g5. Black's going to have to respond with this. He can't take a move, you know, bishop here to b2. This is going to be horrible. He has to take care of this, and then after the queen moves, you know, the rook can come down here on a4 and take. That's going to be completely fine. In the game, Bobby Fischer took right away. Uh, wasn't really looking for kind of the in-between move, um, and took with his rook on a4. And then after the bishop took and the pawn took, the rook's going to come down here to c3. And in this position, both sides are actually equal. Black has a very aggressive um, position. Obviously, his rook here on c3 um, is much more aggressive than it was here on c8. Later on, he can swing his rook over to c8, get those involvements of the game. Again, his queen is eyeing down on the c1 file, so he can always play back up um, if the rook comes down further. So this is not going to be a terrible position for black at all, and white's really going to have to find a nice attack to continue. Luckily for white's being played by one of the greatest chess players of all time, even at the age of 14, he just saw the game so well. And Bobby Fischer played the rook takes here on f7. This is just a really hard move for black to deal with. Now, he could play something, you know, like pawn to h5, which is probably the best move just because it allows, if this rook moves, 
you know, the king can come here to h7 if he needs to. Starting to attack on the king side here. Um, again, really hard move to find in the game. Black actually played rook to c1, giving up any equality or advantage that black may have had. Um, and what he probably saw is, this is going to be completely fine. I'm checking Bobby Fischer. So after the rook comes down, um, you know, there's a discovered attack, and the king's just going to come up over here to h8. And then black's going to be fine. He's going to be in an aggress aggressive position. But, you know, if the rook comes here, then the queen's going to recapture on c1. Black's looking really good right here. Again, he has his rook on f8 ready to get involved into the game. What he didn't see was a nice little deflection move from Bobby Fischer. And it's queen here to f1. And this is huge because, you know, if the rook captures here on f1, uh, then the rook can come down on f1, check, because of the discovered attack. And then let's say if the queen takes here on d5, there's not a whole lot of options. Then the rook can take on f8. And then after the king takes, then the pawn takes. And this is going to be an easy game for Bobby Fischer. Obviously, he's up in material, not only from the major minor piece, but he does have this pass pawn right here that he can easily push forward. Um, and it's going to be, you know, good game for Bobby Fischer. So, uh, you know, in that position, after the queen came here to f1, uh, black decided, okay, I can't really exchange pieces. I'm going to have to figure something else out to do. So instead, he plays the pawn here to h5, which seems reasonable. Um, again, he wants to, it's a little too late though, but he recognizes he needs some sort of counterattack. Unfortunately, he now found a nice little decoy move from Bobby Fischer, and it's queen takes here on c1. Recognizing that the queen can't take here on c1, or the rook can just come here to f1. Again, it was a nice little decoy on c1, but after the decoy was taken, um, and there is a discovered attack on the king, then the rook can just come over here to c1 and take that, that queen. So, uh, recognizing this, you know, black plays queen here to h4, trying to set up the, the queen to h2 here for checkmate, recognizing that, you know, it's just not going very well. Um, Bobby Fischer just has a huge attack, and he just didn't see that queen to f1 move early on. Bobby Fischer now takes on f f8, uh, checking the king, and then after the king comes here to h7, Bobby Fischer plays pawn to h3, uh, stopping the immediate threat of, you know, queen to h1 checkmate. The queen's going to come to g3 again, just trying something. Now just trying to play this queen to h2 checkmate. Uh, but Bobby Fischer says, not going to allow that. I'm just going to take with my pawn here on g4. And then after the pawn comes to h4, kind of a last-ditch effort, you know, trying to push something forward uh, to protect this queen for the checkmate. Then the bishop's going to come here to e6, protecting the pawn. Um, and from here, black resigns and just said, good game. This is what allowed Bobby Fischer to go on and to win the U.S. championship. So definitely, even at the age of 14, recognizing all of just these tactics in chess as far as you know, getting these discovered attacks, um, finding these nice little outpost moves in the center of the board, um, finding nice deflections and decoys. It, it was just really great to see at a huge stage, first U.S. championship, um, that he really put on, you know, all the chess lessons that he really could on his opponent. So hopefully you guys enjoy this video. Again, we're going to be going over all of Bobby Fischer's greatest moments in chess. And hopefully you guys are enjoying this and learning from these. And I'll see you all in the next video. Thanks for watching.